Today's guest grew up fishing the small mountain streams near his Blue Ridge, Virginia home. As a youngster, he started a guiding service and in the late 80s opened the Blue Ridge Fly Fishers in Roanoke, Virginia. He has worked for years to create patterns that solve angling problems. More than once, he has in fact created a platform that a design innovation so effective that dozens of patterns can then be created. Uh, some of these can go head to head with the very best strike generating action of conventional lures. A decade ago, our, our guest returned to the river where he now owns and operates his guide service, specializing in float trips for muskie, smallmouth bass, stripers, trout, and many other species. In addition, he is the Southeastern ed field editor field, uh, for Fly Fisherman Magazine. He's an advisor and brand ambassador for the industry's top brands, including Patagonia, Temple Fork, Scientific Anglers, Costa, and Ranzetti. One of the things I appreciate most about today's guest is his deep respect for the past and those who've helped him along the way. His passion for conservation also seems to grow at about the same pace as his son, Tyler. It's been a pleasure working and traveling with him for the, uh, the past year for the American Saltwater Guide Association. If there's ever a Mount Rushmore for fly tying, today's guest, Blaine Chocolate, is in the running. Blaine, uh, welcome to the Saltwater Edge podcast. Ah, uh, thanks, Peter. I really appreciate you having me. It's uh, it's been a long journey, you know, and it's I've really enjoyed getting to spend time with you over the past year and a half, two years now, I guess. And um, I had a great time up at your show, and hopefully Just we'll have the many box. More. That really was a was a hit. A uh, lot of great feedback. Looking forward to next year. And uh, again, shout out to to your buddy Mike Schmidt, uh, Mike Schultz, rather. You know, yeah, uh, that's that's where that idea came from. Yeah, as soon as I left your uh, show, I went to Schultz's, and uh, they're both great. I love it. I think uh, having the pool there, um, oh, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a game changer you know, <laughs> in, in itself. It blew I mean, people's really, minds. It, there was uh, some folks that, that uh, may have seen it on social or whatever, but uh, uh, or from on the water, but um, there we did our event in a pool, in a hotel, and it had a pool. And, uh, you know, it was February or January, and no one was in the pool. So we went over there with Blaine's Flies. And um, probably three dozen people standing on trash cans and everything to get the best view to watch them swim. It really was it was a treat. And uh, um, yeah, that was great. You know, it's uh, um, I'm really uh, I've oh, a long time ago. I was at a show on Cape Cod that Bob Popovics was at, Catherwood, Bill Peabody, uh, Chris Windrum, um, uh, Paige Rogers, and a bunch of other just top saltwater fly tires. And the format was the same, and I just loved it. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. like this. We need more of this, you know, where you can and, and you guys are so approachable. It really was a gr you know, great feedback we got and look forward to, an, you know, an improved version next year. Um, you know, I think it's interesting. I've read your book um, and uh, Game Changer and I keep it uh, near my fly tying table. Um, but I think one of the things that's very interesting is kind of how you got your start. I know uh, we'd already told the audience it was in the in the trout streams of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And yep. um, I guess it was your mom who gave you a, a lift over to the stream. But I think there's a couple guys you met early on that kind of uh, set a course for you, uh, un maybe unknowingly, but they were wise, you know, right at the outset. And you took the bait, I guess. You know, so oh, yeah. here we are 40 something years later, maybe. 50. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, um, the, the, the couple uh, guys that are on the river when you got there? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um I tell this in the, in, in the book and I, I've, I've spoken about this a few times in several of the talks I've done. Um, and I'm very grateful for all the people that helped me throughout my career. Mm. Um, and, and very early on, this was in the late eighties. Um, I, I was, I think, I don't know, 14, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, my mom was, uh, gracious enough to be able to, to drive me up to this tailwater that I'd heard about. Because we didn't have internet, obviously, or any of that. We, we we didn't even have cable where I lived in the mountains. It was just too expensive to get cable run up the mountains, and you'd have to cut down too many trees to get satellite and all that. So they didn't really want to do that. So yeah. I didn't have a whole lot of information out there other than occasionally going to the grocery store and picking up a Fly Fisherman magazine uh, right. and, and, and then reading books and, and going to the library. So... Um, you know, I, I cut my teeth with my grandfather and my dad, uh, trout fishing and opening day and, you know, catch and keep type of stuff. But on all those trout streams that I grew up on, we had brook trout streams. Um, they were the headwaters to all these streams. And my, my grandfather uh, 
after lunchtime, he would take me up to the, the brook, t- brook trout side of the things and take me up where I caught my first brook trout on a fly. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of, that kind of just stuck with me forever. But, um, we had an Orvis store downtown Roanoke, uh, yeah. where I grew up and they, there was some information there. There were some people there that fished and whatnot. Um, and they were talking about this river, which is called the Jackson river. Jackson. Um, and, it, and it's a tailwater here in Virginia. It's one of two major tailwaters that have really good, uh, brown trout fishing, rainbow trout. So I, I taught my mom into taking me up there, um, one weekend. And this, this was during the winter time. And I got up there, you know, I'd only, I'd only fished a little bit on small mountain streams and, and never were, I really never had to cast more than 15, 20 feet max. Right. right. So right. this river averaged probably a hundred feet wide, wow. um, six, yeah, 60 feet, 70 feet, 40 feet, you know, it, it varied, but it was a, it was a wide river. Um, <clears throat> And but it, it would it would rival in many western rivers more very similar to like the Delaware, wow. um, like the West Branch, yeah, something like big. that. Sure. Yeah, so it's more like West Branch side cool. in a lot of places. Um not the main stem, but the West Branch. So um in deposit, I think that's where I fished it. So it's mm-hmm. about that size. So anyway, I was up there not knowing anything and uh, I was kind of floundering around, didn't really have the right stuff and at that time, I didn't really have any knowledge at all about um, bugs other than what I had in my my Orvis uh, guide to tying flies and stuff, and just sure. you know had the basics and all that. So I did, but while I was fishing, I noticed two guys that, uh, that were upstream of me, and they were they were doing really well catching fish every couple casts, both of them. And after seeing this for you know, 20, 30 minutes, I eventually went up to the one that happened to be closer to me. Um, and his, his name happened to be Steve Heiner. Mm -hmm. And he ended up being a, an aquatic entomologist at Virginia tech. Um, and his good buddy that was with him is Harrison, Steve, um, who is, uh, a famous fly tire and um, a couple books. Yeah. Yep. He wrote, uh, terrestrials with Ed Koch. Um, and, uh, so Harry, Harry's, uh, was it ended up being a very good friend of mine mentor and really introduced me to a lot of these people that, that we're going to talk about later on. Um, but this kind of falling into the right spot, um, at a very early age. Uh, so I went up to Heiner and, um, he was very nice to me. And, uh, I was asking him, it's like, you know, obviously as a kid, I was like, I'd love to know what you're doing. It's like, could you show me the flies that you're using or whatever? I don't, I've obviously, I've only caught one fish. I've been here for, a while and i've watched you guys catch 20 fish at least you know and he goes well i'll tell you what i'm gonna do better than that he goes i want you to follow me so he took me up to his truck and he pulled out uh out of his bag in the back of his jeep he had um these insect vials scientific vials and he had some alcohol and he had all this aquatic entomology stuff because that's what he was um, and gave me this book called McCafferty's guide to aquatic entomology. And he said, take this home and I want you to go back down to the stream. He said, because there's a lot of things in the stream right now, specifically that's going to teach you a lot about fishing Mm -hmm. Um, because the, the, all the answers are right there in front of you. You just have to open your eyes and, and uh, instead of me giving you the answer, I want you to figure it out on your own. I was like, okay, it wasn't exactly the answer I wanted at a young age. I mean, everybody wants a handful of flies, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I want a handful of flies and show me exactly what you're doing. That's what I wanted. (laughs) Uh, But he didn't do that, um, which I'm grateful now to the fact. And and knowing Steve and Harry, I don't think they would ever do that anyway, um, just because they're characters and they they like screwing with you. Mm -hmm. So I went down and collected a bunch of these bugs and it was very obvious what was in these in the stream. I mean, you pick up one rock and it would literally be crawling with this one insect. And it happened to be, after doing my research and reading about it, um, it happened to be a black fly larvae. Um, and for those that may not know about black fly larva, uh, it's a very prevalent small insect would be classified in the bit midge category being, you know, size 20, 22, 24s and whatnot. And but it was very specific about their life cycle. Um, 
black fly larva would when disturbed, like if somebody would walk across the stream, and I've eventually read more about this later in life. I mean, you hear about the uh, Miracle Mile on the San Juan, yeah, and, the and you hear about the San Juan Shuffle. That's the same scenario there. Mm -hmm. And it happens to be black fly. So black fly larvae look like a, a bowling pin. Um, they their their heads are small, they are bigger, and they get really thin in the midsection, and they get really fat at their at their mm -hmm. back end. Mm -hmm. And they're they're kind of could be tan to olive to to darker or whatever based on whatever substrate they're living on, and when disturbed, they would release themselves from the rock on a silken thread and hang in the current until they could reattach to some other substrate that they felt comfortable on. So yeah. they, that leaves them very vulnerable to trout to feed on them, and that's why. On the Miracle Miles, why they they kind of that San Juan Shuffle was kind of frowned upon because you're basically chumming, right? Uh, right. So I didn't know anything about that, but it uh, it was it was really interesting um, to read about that in that book. So I, I I had the tying materials, the dubbings and stuff, and so I mean, having an artistic mind, I was able to kind of match that bug specifically. Uh, for what I saw that from the vials and the collections mm -hmm. I made, I made, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. was really the only bug that was in that I could find, other than a couple caddis pupa, you know, mm -hmm. shucks and whatnot. But uh, that was, a, I mean, there was thousands and thousands of these bugs on the rocks. So the other thing about their life cycle that I read about is when they pupate, they will seal themselves off in this pupal shuck, much like a caddis, and and then they will pupate with it inside of that uh that shuck and then they will emerge by cutting themselves out of that shuck in an air bubble mm. so it just happened to be coincidence in my era when i was in school at that age i was I, you know i think i was maybe a freshman in high school or maybe in eighth grade i can't remember um mm. but all the girls were were buying these little glass beads from the craft stores and putting them on pins and wearing them on their shoes. It was like a fashion statement. I mean, they had okay. them as earrings, they had them on their shirts, they had them on sweaters and it was a thing. So it was really easy that we had, we did have craft stores. So I got my mom to take me that week <laughs> to a craft doing all the store. work. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I, I mean, I owe a lot of this to my mom I and mean, she was <laughs> often, I mean, she would go up to the Jackson that day and stayed six seven hours you know and it's in the middle of the winter yeah. freezing and uh but but she was a trooper she knew how much i loved it because every chance i got i would get i would get her to buy me a magazine i was always wanting something fly fishing i even got her to drive me up um about three two and a half hours up north to uh uh do you remember uh harry murray yes do you remember that name yes in so, shenandoah Yep. So the other thing is my grandfather got me a subscription to Virginia wildlife, which would have fly fishing articles every once in a while. And Harry Murray was kind of the, the, I guess the Man. field field yeah. guy. And he, every time there was an article about fly fishing, Harry Murray was yeah. in it. So I learned about Harry Murray through that. And he also had a fly fishing catalog. Um, so I got my mom to drive me up there to, uh, to uh, interview him uh, mm -hmm. for a, for a school project, like, what you wanted to be when you grew up. And it was, I right. uh, wanted to be a professional fly fisherman, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so I had that experience with him and, and got his book. So I read about that and all that. And, you know, he wrote that smallmouth bass fly fishing book. And, you know, uh, someone that I ended up meeting later on who, who just passed away, Dave Whitlock, um, mm. was someone also to help me out in my career a little bit. And, but uh, he illustrated all that stuff. But getting off of that, Going back to this, I was I was able to take those beads yep. and um and, and just in my mind's eye, thinking if an insect's in a glass is in an air bubble, you know, it, it, there might be a little dark around the air bubble and whatever. Because I mean, they had so many different glass beads, and it's the same glass beads that we use in fly fishing now. But this was way before glass beads were even introduced into the fly fishing industry. Right. So um, you just, you so just saw of, the the potential connection. I did, and, yeah. and I and I owe this all, all to Heiner. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I just I, I did I was able to use the, my like I said my creative mind and and whatever, and I, I, I tied these these what I thought would a, a merger would look like, and yeah, and I ended up taking them. I got I taught my mom to take me back up there the following weekend, and uh, 
you know, I, I read about how all that works. So I figured if I, I just threw a, a, you know, nymphing it and did a tandem, did the larva as the, as the point fly and did the, uh, tied a, uh, some 6X tippet to the bend of that hook about two feet off and, and, and add that emerger, that I, I, I would surely be imitating one of those versions that the fish would be feeding on. Right. right? So, you know, I was dead, dead nymphing it as it, I threw it upstream and just, you know, high, high sticking it and just using the indicator and whatnot as it got beside me would lower the rod. And then as it went below me, I'd let it kind of swing like an emerger and let that nymph come up off the bottom and then having that air bubble hanging up behind it. And I got, you know, I was catching quite a few fish. I'd either get them on the larvae or I'd get them on the merger. Did, and, yeah, did and you I get was, the chance to show that to Heiner? I did. Yeah. So long story short, I, I was talking, I was fishing. And next thing I know, Heiner shows up behind me. And I saw them there, but I didn't want to bother him because I really didn't know him that well. But uh, he, he and Steve, uh, who I really didn't meet that, but for a brief second the first time, uh, they both kind of came up behind me. It's like, like we see that you're, uh, you you learned something. Uh, <laughs> so what are you, what are you doing here? It's like so. I opened up my box and I showed them, and they both started laughing at me. Yeah. Uh, and they're they were. I'm like, you know, I was kind of insulted a little bit at first. Um, and if you knew these guys, you you would be too, because they they they're, they're, like I said, they like to give you a lot of a lot of grief, especially the more you get to know them. Yeah. But um, but uh, they never gave me anything easy ever. But uh, but they ended up opening up their boxes, and they were pretty much fishing the exact same thing. Did they have a bead on uh, Yes. They oh, had no. beads on theirs. Yep. They loved it. They absolutely loved That's it. That's awesome. Um, yep. So I thought you were going to blow their minds by yep. showing them something that they didn't have. Yep. Oh. So he goes, you, he goes, yeah, well, he goes, you're a good student. He goes, obviously, you, you, you took what I oh, said yeah. to heart. It's like, yeah, man, I'm after seeing you guys catching fish left and right. That was the aha moment. I mean, I've had several aha moments with, throughout my career. Yep. And it's all always been on the water, observing stuff and, you know, seeing positive and negative reactions to the fish and how they, how they either take it or don't take it. And, you know, I think I've learned more from fish not eating than I have from fish eating, Sure, you know, there's um, data in that a whole lot of data. Yeah. So you can, you can take it and be mad or not even think about what's going on, or you can actually analyze, you know, what's really happening. And for me, that was a huge learning curve at a very young age. And obviously, right. science says that you learn a whole lot more as a kid, yeah. and your brain absorbs so much more. I can I can attest to that now that I'm 50. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I don't think I can learn anything anymore. I feel like I, you know, I, I'm just I'm happy to retain your, your hard drive's full. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. So, um, you know, I know you spent a lot of time you know, fishing stripers up here, even, but also. Uh, a lot of musky and pike and stuff like that. And, um, and I know uh, I sort of want to go through the progression of your flies because your book has, you know, probably 15 different patterns in a linear kind of progression. And I, I, in previous conversations with you, I know sometimes there's an idea that you have that doesn't quite work out, goes on the shelf, but it might show up a couple iterations later as being useful, you know? Yep. So yep. Um, the, the, the kind of place I'm thinking... And and I did want to relate it to 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 um, predators and triggers, but I know in the beginning, uh, I think I first came to know your name was 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 with the gummy minnow, um, and uh, you know because it was a, it still is a great uh, Albi imitation uh, that small brown one, um, yeah. and it nails profile and it's got some swim. But what was the uh, what was the uh, impetus or thought process? behind that one i know I, I guess to stick with the uh, jackson river analogy you've turned over a lot of rocks since then and uh, yep. <laughs> you know and done a lot of observing but uh you know your your flies uh i think you start off with a with a you know with an intention of uh all fly designers do but there's a problem or something you saw that you wanted to address what is the where does the gummy fit in there yeah so uh we're gonna get into this is some stories i really kind of forgot about and just yeah. kind of reminded me um like I said, I've, I've been really fortunate to fall in the right spot at the right time and meeting the right people throughout my career that's kind of helped me kind of move forward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the great thing about our sport. A lot of the greats have been – I just listened to Popovic's podcast today with Millhouse. Millhouse, yeah. And, yeah, and just it was just really interesting talking about Popovic's and the people that kind of moved him along and, and taught him and 
how he got into fly fishing and all that kind of stuff. And it, it's, it's really interesting because that's really kind of how it happened to me. I mean, you know, I'm meeting Steve Heiner and then Harry Steves, right. who ended up uh, being a really close friend of mine. And we ended up going business together um, as we progressed. You know, like I, I met him when I was like 14, 15 years old and we stayed friends. Yeah. And uh, as I got older and, and opened up a fly shop, I was able to uh, he started coming into the shop and we got closer and closer. And, you know, and you know, he, he knew I liked tying and we fished together prior to that and whatever here and there. And, but we, when I opened up my fly shop, Harry, Harry was getting close to retirement or even retiring at that point. And he was kind of looking for something to do more. Right. And, uh, and I think he saw the potential in me and, and my love for tying and the yeah. creativity of it right. and, and invited me to start going to the fly fishing shows, uh, Chuck Baremski shows. Sure. And, and that opened up a huge door to me. I mean, I, I got to meet all these people I'd read about and, you know, people that were heroes to me, like Bob Popovich, Clouser, Lefty, yeah. uh, Whitlock, all those guys. Right. And Harry knew them because he'd always been going to these shows, even back way back when, when uh, Chuck started his first show back in Seven Springs. Oh. Um, so it, that's how far back it goes. Um, mm -hmm. And back then it wasn't that far back. <laughs> really because right. right. you're right at this point you're looking at the early you know like 94 95 yeah um so anyway long story short on that uh once i started meeting these people and you know i'd kind of graduated from trout fishing and moved into smallmouth bass and then my grandmother had cable so i would go into <laughs> town and, and stay stay with her on friday nights uh especially if i didn't have anything going on you know and to me, you know, you could go on a date or whatever, hang out with buddies. But sometimes, you know, fishing just had that calling. And, and yeah. there were great shows on TV at that time right. when you, you had Flip Pallet's show, Walker's K. And right. um, and a good buddy of mine who I love dearly is Larry Dahlberg, his right. hunt for big fish. Right. And 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 those those shows really sparked an interest in me about, like, there's another world out there other than trout. Right. Um, you know, seeing you know, flip catching tarpon and bonefish and permit and sailfish and everything else. And then seeing Larry catching everything in the world. And, right. and but the, the one the thing that, yeah. yeah, right. And traveling all over. I mean, yeah. he's the true pioneer that really opened up a lot of these places that we go to totally now. Agree. A lot of people don't realize that, but Larry's yeah. the reason that we have all these exotic places that we go to because he's the guy that discovered it and got things going. Got to work. Out. Um, but I'm getting off, I'm getting off on another tangent, but, but anyway, uh, being able to go to those shows, it also it also really sparked my interest in saltwater. Mm -hmm. um, so when I started my fly shop, I, um, I started going to the Outer Banks. And prior to that, I started fishing uh, the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay with a good friend of mine, um, Hank Norton, mm -hmm. who, who was a, a college football coach. He was actually a Hall of Fame college football coach. Wow. Uh, for for a local school here called Ferrum, and he won a couple national championships. Wow! And uh, but anyway, he uh, he he was a fly fisherman from way back, right? And um, you know, he he invited me to come stay at his farmhouse on the uh, uh, on the bay, um, and that's where I got to experience striped bass for the first time. Sure. And they were eating glass minnows, uh, mm -hmm. and it was in the fall. That was the first time seeing a blitz and all that. And this would have been around probably 95. Yeah. Um, so moving forward, you know, just a few years later, um, after going to the shows with Harry, I mean, I got to meet Popovics and, you know, just seeing his surf candies and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's really sparked an interest, but something to really kind of happen is having a fly shop. I, I got to meet a couple interesting people that were in um, the textile industry and different, 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 avenues and sure. we just would start talking about stuff and i just had these ideas you know guiding and and smallmouth bass particularly is a really good classroom yeah because where i live i mean the water's clear and you can interact with the fish and see how they re they re they respond to what you throw at them mm -hmm. uh, whether it's good or bad mm -hmm. and you know on occasion i'd have 
uh, anglers that would bring fly anglers that would bring someone that didn't fly fish. So seeing soft plastics and seeing how well the fish reacted to those, I mean, all I had to do is just give them a soft plastic bait. I didn't have to worry about those. They were going to catch fish almost every yeah, time. The other end of the boat. Yeah. 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 I mean, it literally, I mean, and we're talking about the heyday of smallmouth bass fishing here in Virginia. I mean, yeah. when it was so good here, I mean, it was world class. I mean, yeah. you know, 50, 100 fish days, no problem. I mean, it was, that was, that was normal. Yeah. Um, and that didn't, that wasn't like, that was, that's not bragging or, or it's just the way it was. I yeah. thought that's how smallmouth bass fishing was supposed to be. Yeah. Like, if you didn't catch 50 fish, you had a terrible day. And that's yeah. what, that's per angler. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but now it's not anything like that. But, but anyway, just seeing the soft plastics and how they moved and it just really intrigued me because, you know, we flies have a, a, you know, they have certain triggers built into them and we can get into all that triggers mm -hmm. and, and all that. And Doug Hannon and uh, the bass professor, I don't know if you remember him, but there's, the name, yeah. there's all these things uh, that kind of go into it, but just kind of glazing over that. Uh, the soft plastics really intrigued me. And then I got in, you know, I said, I got into that saltwater world and then having that shop and having these people coming in, that I could talk to about materials and whatever. I was like, well, do you have this and that and whatever? And then, yeah. And so Harry and I were going to the shows and Joe Blados sure. had come up. So he had come out with the, his crease fly right, right at that same time. And he was taking this foil and wrapping it around foam and it, you know, and all that. So Harry having a, a, a chemistry background, he's like, you know, I, I can do a lot better than what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And and so he's like, so we formed this material, this company called Loco Foam. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so it started off with the with the different shimmery colors and all and you know all that different stuff and and then then I'm I was like you know what I mean it really got my wheels spinning I mean I got my first fly in with Umqua, um, my, my disc sliders and poppers and whatever for smallmouth and uh, but but the gummy the the what the gummy was already in my mind I already mm -hmm. knew how to tie it. I just needed the material to do it. And that's, that's how it is. And then my, my whole career, I've, I've never sat down at a desk and just sat there and tied until fly came. I'd, I would work on a fly, whether it's dreaming about it, thinking about it on the water, just putting it away and filing it back. And I'm doing it right now. I mean, yeah. I, I've been working on a crab pattern for permit for years yeah. and, and I, I haven't sat down until recently to tie it because I just wasn't done in my mind yet. Yeah. And later on, as I got closer with Popovics, and this is leading into a story with him, he always said a great fly design comes from problem solving. Right. So my problem I was trying to solve was uh, creating a fly that would work like those soft plastic baits yeah. that I was seeing. Yeah. And so I was able to get these materials, and I, I was able to put all these materials together and created Silly Skin. And literally, once I got the materials, I was so excited to sit down and I tied a gummy minnow with less than five minutes. I mean, it was yeah. done. And it, it looked exactly like a glass minnow. Right. Uh, and I was super excited about it, calling Harry. And it's like, you got to come down here today and look at this. And he did. And he goes, man, you're really, this is something, this is, this is a big deal. And I'm like, I was super excited about it. And that was like. The small mouth liked it? Uh, yeah. So I, I tested a little bit. To be honest, this, so I was guiding the all summer. And. I, I didn't, wasn't able to get onto the vice to actually get the materials and everything until the past smallmouth season. Ah. So I got back on the vice like late October. Um, and I got finally got the materials late in the fall. And that's past smallmouth season for us and where it's really good. Yeah. And <clears throat> so I was kind of locked in the shop. So all I had time to do was tie at that point. But I had what I was doing back then is I was hosting trips, starting to host trips down to Cape Lookout. There Parker's Island. Yeah. And um I would I would I never missed the chance to go to um Tom Earnhardt's party and, and right. uh Jones Brothers, uh Donnie Jones, uh they would have a party there on mm -hmm. at Tom Earnhardt's house at Cape Lookout, and that was the who's who of fly fishing would go to that. I mean, you would have you would have Jerry Gibbs that would go. Um, I mean, all these editors, all these uh magazine guys, yeah, fly anglers, even Rod designers, um, 
uh, Jerry Seam went. Um, I mean, you name it. It was an amazing place to be. And I'm just, I went just so I could maybe get to know some of these people and just try to learn from them and whatever. And, you know, selfishly, I wanted to, I just wanted to hang out with, you know, sure. the who's who and fly fishing. Right. And so I tied up a pile of those flies and, and all kinds of sizes just because, you know, you know how it is in saltwater. Some, you know, one week you're going to, the you know, fish are going to be eating two inch baits next week. They might be on three inch, you know, or the next day they might be, you know, it depends on what depends. type where they're, you know, spearing or silver sides or your bay anchovies, you name it. Right. Um, so I tied up every size I could think of. I probably had 200 or 300 of these gummies and never even go. used them. Before. Gummies. Listen to you now. <laughs> yep. yep. So I never, I never used them before. And, uh, I get down to this party and I'll never, I mean, this is probably the, the, the game changing moment in my career. Yeah. Um, I, I, I purposely, uh, was looking for Popovics and, um, I found him and I had a pig picking and just so happened to find pops in line to get some get some barbecue. Yeah. And uh so I was like, you know, just kind of sheepishly went up to him. He was like, I don't know if you remember me and I, we've met a few times and whatever. And but Bobby and Bobby is always super gracious. Whether he, he knew who I was or not, he he acted Did like you he, feel like it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I told him I like I had something I wanted him to see. And he he was he said, Yeah, let me see it. I was like, and so I showed him you know, the different ones and whatever. And he was just really excited about it and very nice about it. And he said, you know what? I want you to stay here. I'm going to be back in a few minutes. And I, I, I just want to, I want to show this to somebody. I was like, okay. So I got in line and just kind of hanging out. And I, I remember the sun was setting, it was getting dark and the spotlights came on in the back of the back of it. Cause it was in their backyard. So they yeah. had a big spotlight that kind of was in the middle of the, the backyard and whatever. And Pops came back over and uh, he said, I want to want you to follow me. So, and there was a bunch of people out there in the back. I mean, it was packed. Yeah. And I just remember it's like the seas parting, you know, <laughs> and we're, we're kind of going through and you know how big Pops is anyway. So yeah. he's making, he's, I'm like following him. You're like drafting a, him. Yeah, yeah. He's like a big, he's like a big, uh, yeah, a, a big tackle, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, so the seas are parting and we get into the middle of the sea in, in the middle of the sea, it's like a ring. And, and yeah. lo and behold, it's lefty holding court right yeah. there in front of all these people. And he's got my flies in his hands. And uh, Bob just says, this is the guy I was talking about. And I'd met lefty once or twice. Yeah. And I mean, that shows, you know, he gets, he meets thousands of people. And uh, he, he just being lefty, being lefty, another great guy. He's just super, super excited about it. Um, wanting to know everything about it. Um, just telling me he thought this was going to be great. He goes, well, tell me how it works. I'm like, well, to be honest, I've never used it. He goes, oh, there is no doubt that this is going to work. Um, he goes, well, tell me how you tied it and whatever. So I did. And I was like, well, I don't know if it's going to work. He goes, oh, this is going to be like rolling a wine bottle in a jail cell. You know, yeah. that was one of his favorite, <laughs> his favorite things. So um, he goes, he, he asked me, he goes, unfortunately, I've got to leave tomorrow, but do you mind if I have several? I'm like, let you could have as many as you want. Here's so I gave him, I gave him probably a dozen or two dozen of them. I don't mm -hmm. remember. And Brian Horsley and Sarah Gardner were there, um, who I knew very well, and Clouser and all. That. I, I gave out flies to a lot of people. Uh, yeah. Henry Cowan, you know Henry. Yep. Um, oh, Henry Henry was there. It's where I really first got to meet Henry, and uh, so we were. I was super excited. I wasn't able to get out that next day early. I was actually fishing with uh, a rep, um, Bill Dawson. Sure. You know, Bill yeah. and, um, and he, Donnie Jones a little bit. They, they, Tom Earnhardt, um, allowed us to use the Jones brothers boat. They, they had boats set up for reps and whoever to use them and go out. So we got out a little later, but I knew, I remember on the ride out, um, you could hear a lot of the guides talking back and forth and scratching and all that stuff. And, just remember this one guy asking Brian, it's like, what are you, what are you and Sarah using? It's like, we can't get a bite. What are you guys doing? He goes, uh, <laughs> Brian goes, you know, how dry Brian is. He goes, we're, we're using one of Blaine's condom flies. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I was like, well, you know, I didn't know what to think about that. But I was publicity excited. Is good publicity. Yeah. It was great publicity. Yeah. And, uh, and it was great because they worked and, yeah. um, 
So uh, Brian and Sarah were actually the first people to catch, uh, you know, uh, any fish on a, on a gummy minnow that I know of. Right. So, right. But, um, but I actually, I actually view that fly as a failure in, in, mm -hmm. my, in my fly design. Um, okay. wh what it did do is it, 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 uh, it works really well when you, when you have schooling fish or if you have um, schooling baits or whatnot mm -hmm. um yeah. it's not what i would call a searching pattern mm -hmm. uh, although i have had great success on some of the really tough beaches in florida when the snook are cruising the beach and being super picky yeah, uh, i love um, that yeah <laughs> yeah me too i thing. do too yeah. i love it um and you know i've caught i've caught them using it as kind of a searching pattern not when they're your fish are in and feeding on you know schooling baits and whatever um but what I was disappointed about is the fly didn't move like the soft plastics that I designed it to move, even though it's a super stretchy material, it did not, it did not have the movement that this I was way. wanting. Yeah. Yeah. And in my mind, movement is everything. I mean, right. you have, you have triggering qualities and you have attracting qualities. Yeah. So, and if you have both built into the fly, that's even better. And, um, What's good about the gummy minnow is it looks like the real food, but it doesn't necessarily act like the real food, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I can mimic it and match the hatch going back to my trout days, um, and I can make it look exactly like the bait that I'm trying to emulate, yep. but it doesn't necessarily act like the bait I'm trying to emulate. Yep. So, or have erratic movements that might cause a predator to react in a positive way to eat something. So um, can I stop you real quick? You just said erratic movement because I think of the 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 gummy and other kind of some you know flies that have a more consistent movement, like some lures do, like a lipped sp minnow. It just yeah. does its thing, but it doesn't yeah. do anything else. It does that. You can rip it yeah. faster, in which case it'll do its thing faster, but it yeah. won't do anything out of that rhythm. Is that is that the is it? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is stuff I've learned later on and, uh, and uh -huh. just, um, being mentored by, by Larry Dahlberg, um, who to me is the greatest angler that's ever lived. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's, I mean, he's designed some of the greatest baits, some of the, one of the best flies, a diver. Yeah. Um, you know, he, his philosophy on a lot of this stuff, um, you know, um, and he was good friends with Doug Hannon, the bass professor and having triggering qualities and attracting qualities, but, you have mechanical and non-mechanical movements, right? Okay. Um, and what you're referring to would be a mechanical, just a, just the same movement or, or just a straight move, just a straight, like the gummy, it might flutter and wobble a little bit, but it's not going to, it's not going to have any kind of crazy action that yeah. I was looking for. Right. So be a repetitive would, action. It will have a repetitive, repetitive mechanical action. Like, Got it. Exactly. Um, I think some of the best baits in the world um, have a non-mechanical action. And I think that's what really, in my mind, triggers fish in a positive way more than mechanical actions do. Mechanical actions can get you more follows and stuff. And I'm not saying that they don't work. They obviously work, but usually you have to impart some kind of different, like if it's going straight, like a mechanical action, usually you're going to have to stop it or speed it up or stop speed, stop speed, you know, that kind of thing. Right. which you're making it not be a mechanical action at that point. You're taking it right? out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I've always looked for, I've always looked into design to create something that's going to have inherent non-mechanical actions in it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you obviously with a mechanical action bait or, or fly, you can create that by how you retrieve it through the water. But if you have, if you can create that in the design, it makes it much easier for anglers that don't fish on a daily basis, right? right? That, that that don't understand that predator prey relationship, right? You know, and, and as a designer and a guide, to me that that's kind of the holy grail of it. Yeah, I mean, there's, and, to me, I think of there's a handful of retrieves, and even the you know, I know it's I do it. You, I just get not a, in a rut or a rhythm. You're just not maybe as focused as you need to be, and you know, uh -huh. you're not creating that erratic thing. You know, I'd be curious, uh, just thinking about what you've just talked about, you know, you know how you were just describing in the beginning, you're, 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 you were nymphing up there on the Jackson, and then as it get below, you'd let it swing. And then what happens at the end of that swing is the, it comes under tension, it speeds up and it rises. 
That's yep. an erratic motion. And that it is how many of those hits do you get at the bottom of swinging a streamer through a run or, you know, we've got a similar kind of fishing technique for striped bass in a, in a, in an inlet or, or a, a tidal Creek, you know, you swing. And then when it gets to the bottom, you always give it a little jiggle, but it speeds up and climbs because yep. of, you know, the water running underneath it. Right. And oh, yeah. when the hits come right then from, from that change in, in pace, it looks like an escape or something. It just trout stripers, just the list is long of what hit that particular yep. part of a retrieve. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's also uh, something that, you know, um, Dahlberg and we, I mean, I, I was very fortunate uh, to have a good friend of mine, Jake Jordan introduce us years mm -hmm. ago. And I was just up at Larry's house and we were, we were really talking about because a really exciting thing along with the chocolate factory that I've created um, here is, you know, Dahlberg and I are going to start working together a lot. Uh, yep. Yeah, so, he, you know, he, he owns, he, he and a couple other guys own Hedron who, yeah. you know, Larry created Flash and, Flash -a and, all, and, yeah. and all that stuff. A lot of people yeah. don't know that, but no, I, mean, I didn't know that. I knew he was involved in Flash, but I didn't know he was involved in the company. Oh yeah. Yep. So he, he and Don Muir and, and another, uh, another guy that I haven't, haven't met, um, so anyway, super excited about that. But we we talk about like different actions. Like you're talking about like the rise and yeah. the swing and you know, like for streamers, a lot of times when you're letting it swing, like you might have a fish that's seeing it, but when it swings, you're start and this is a big thing on muskies. It's like as it swings across and then starts coming back upstream or rising. Yeah. That's when it's actually going from showing profile to fish is, you know, uh looking at it from downstream. It's yeah. showing it's showing profile. Right. right. But depends on the direction of the fish where it's coming from. It may not be until it hits straight below you. Yeah. And then if the fish was swinging from, you know, left to right. Sure. And the fish is far left and it's seeing it come at just seeing its tail. Right. Right. Swinging. And then all of a sudden it sees that side profile, which a lot of and that's a built in trigger for a lot of predatory fish. And once they it's see that, just a side profile, just seeing that side profile is ah. a trigger for a fish to smash it, especially fish yeah. with teeth. Um, yeah. That's a that's a big deal. Okay. Um, so I learned that a lot with muskie. But, you know, like we're talking with Larry about stuff and, you know, um, rising and falling. That's why his diver bug is so important. Like, mm -hmm. you know, his the Dahlberg diver and how, you know, he created that from smallmouth fishing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's amazing how many really good flies have been created based based on smallmouth. It really, right. it's really, really interesting. So that dive and then the bubble trails and whatever, but that dive and then that rise up, that slow rise, right, is a big deal because you know, one, it's it's like bottom contact is a huge deal. That a jigging action where you actually like a clouser where or a jig where it dives yep. and then you retrieve it, it comes up, but then falls. Mm -hmm. A diver. A Dahlberg diver's buoyant, so you pull it using intermediate or sink tip lines or even floating lines. You're pulling it, and then it's rising, but it's doing the same thing a jig does, just the opposite. Right. Versus, so you leave it. You, you take stop retrieving, and it's going to rise. Versus yep. the clouser is going to fall. Right. Yep. Well, so those are all. Those are all like it's change of direction, you know, and and those are all like those are truly non mechanical movements, really, right. if you think about it. Right. Um, so all those things are really, I don't think a lot of people think about it that I think, way. Honestly, but. Blaine, I think more and more people are thinking about it. In other words, I think the, the right, your, your, your articles, your book, your flies, and, 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 you know, I know you stand on the shoulders of, of many others, you know what I mean? You're oh, the yeah, first, 100%. To say that, first to say yep. that, right. But I just see, a you know, and one of the things I want to get into in, in, in uh, is, uh, you know, we keep using the word C, um, but I know, I believe the muskie, but I know the striper feeds off its C's, honestly, off its lateral line, right? It perceives yeah. something out there a ways away, right? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't see it with any real definition. Maybe then it sees silhouette, it becomes aware of its presence, right? From vibration. Then, yeah. and correct me where I go wrong, um, you know, then silhouette maybe, but nothing really uh, detailed until it's really right on top of it, at least for the striper, is the musky kind of similar, isn't it? Lateral line predator? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, they, yeah, they have a 
very distinct lateral line and a lot of predatory fish have that. Um, and obviously the bigger they are, the, the more prevalent that is, but okay. there's also this other thing on their jaw. Um, yeah. and Larry and I, we talked about that too. And, you know, just like sharks, uh, yeah. sharks have that amplify of Lorenzetti, you know, all those little dots on their nose, uh -huh. you know, um, and, and those are sensors, those are pit sensors, much like a, um, you know, they can sense things a long ways away. Vibrations. So, yeah. Vibrations or, okay. or even smells or whatever. Okay. Um, so muskies have these sensors on their jaw. Um, uh, I don't know scientifically if this is right or not, but Larry, we've had numerous conversations about that, that we feel like that those pits in their jaw and they, they all have them. Yeah. Um, th that might have that as well. Uh, that could be that. I'm not saying that that's what it is, but we've all, we've often spoke about that and wondered. Um, I don't know what else those pits would be there for. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and you know, like paddlefish, like we've gotten paddlefish before, and they have just thousands of neurosensors all over their rostrum. You know, oh. uh, there's a lot of fish that you know. That's that's how not just what their lateral lines, but they have other sensors on their body. That, so like, that's how they become aware of a potential bait, you know, of a potential yep. food, right? And, yep. and you know, uh, we were talked about the gummy to begin with, and you said in some ways it was a failure. Is that is the T-bone the next logical one in that progression that we should discuss in terms of trying to, like, solve a problem that wasn't present in the, you know, the, the, yep. that's an enhancement on the gummy? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, so I'll, I'll consider all these flies um, the progression to the Game Changer platform. Yeah, um, because one to me, it's always been, you know, match profile, silhouette action, yep. um, not necessarily in that order, uh, but but it's very important, obviously. So moving forward in my career, you know, getting into the saltwater so much, um, not taking anything away from trout, but it didn't kind of hold my interest as much. And, mm -hmm. you know, seeing Dahlberg show catching muskies. Um, really held my interest because I knew we had them here in Virginia. Sure. Big, and, big inshore game fish for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's big. I mean, it's, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, other than striped bass in our local lakes, that was the only other giant predator fish that I've really had an opportunity to go after Got it. on a daily basis. So, um, I had a good friend who I also met through Harry and Steve Heiner, his name's David Garst. Um, and we became good friends and fished together because he was the only other person I knew that fly fish that was my age. Mm -hmm. This is going way back, but, but we stayed friends and we still are today, but he, um, he got into musky fishing with conventional tackle. And, um, you know, I was guiding smallmouth bass trips on the James river and new rivers and whatever. And, you know, um, I was seeing all these muskies all over the place. And, um, I was just starting to kind of hone the knowledge that I'd learned from saltwater and, and meeting Popovics and, and seeing, you know, another guy who you don't hear much about anymore is Rich Murphy. Sure. Um, I no, I talked to him uh, about a week ago because you mentioned him in a conversation we had in the past. And I reached out to him and he's going to come on the podcast in a couple of weeks. How's he doing? He's doing OK. You know, I haven't had yeah. a long conversation when we went back and forth. And, you know, but uh, you prompt you reminded me his book is you know also near my fly tying table there's some tremendous ideas yeah. in there he's yeah well he's an engineer so. yeah exactly <laughs> right exactly yeah. right. but it's really it's special for sure yeah so he you know meeting him just me just having the, the 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 show circuit was just a wealth of information you know and just seeing what other people were doing at the vice and just bouncing ideas off of people and uh and then you know having Popovic's there to, and seeing all the stuff that he was doing mm -hmm. and then meeting rich it just happened to kind of like i said it, my, my career is all just it's just almost like it's been meant to be somehow it just it's it's <laughs> I, I, I wish i could say i had to work really hard um for the designs right but they just kind of came to me but i mean if i guess if you step back from it I mean, I spent a lot of hours on the water getting my butt kicked, not catching fish, but right. also, I guess, put myself in, in the right situation and was blessed to be able to meet the right people at the right time. But um, seeing Popovic's beast flies yeah. and his reverse style stuff and and then, you know, knowing Rich, he introduced me to this this body tubing year. I mean, golly, it's been. It, it has to be like early 90s. 
Yeah. He introduced me to this body tubing and I just kind of had it, you know, and um, he goes, he goes, this stuff is a little too stiff for me. If there's something you could play with, you creative, you might be able to figure out something with this. Yeah. It's like, okay. And so I, he, I took a, uh, I don't know. He gave me a, I don't remember how much. So I took it home, started playing around with it and, you know, it's, it's getting into the musky stuff. It's like, you know, um, but one of the biggest problems with musky is getting their attention to actually decide to eat because yeah. muskies are so good at what they do. They don't have to eat because they're, they're, I mean, they're the apex predator in any body of water that they live in. Yeah. So, um, they spend half their time sleeping at least half, probably 75% of their lives just laying wow. on the bottom sleeping. Yeah. And then, you know, if they get hungry or something kind of swims by that looks like it might be an opportunity to kill something that they'll, they'll go kill it. Yeah. And then they'll go back and digest it for however long and then take a nap and whatever and that's one yeah. reason muskies are the fish of ten thousand casts right so um taking the stuff that popovics had created with his his uh his beast flies and hollows and I, I was playing around with those and and getting some interest in the muskies but over time what i was noticing with them is they were starting to kind of compress and they would get slicked out and not hold their they wouldn't they'd, hold their they'd shape get thin they would get thinner, yeah. right? Um, they worked great for a while, but just in the currents and just rep repetitive fishing, I just felt like they were, once they got kind of compressed a little bit, they just didn't have that presence in the water that 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 really kind of got that fish's interest. Mm -hmm. um, so I started playing with the body tubing and started putting it on the heads and making a big bulbar, bulbous head instead of deer hair. Like deer hair, you can create a big, like a muddler head. Yeah. Or, or Hooks like a water bulk. and other things though. There's yeah. Trade -offs. yeah. Yeah. Like a bulkhead too. Yeah. Um, I did all that stuff, but what that did is that would make it ride higher in the water. And, and that's not necessarily what I wanted. I wanted right. it to get a little bit deeper, but one thing I did notice though, was when you created that big, like muddler style head or big bulb head, um, that created, it slowed the body down and it would make it turn. Mm-hmm in the water jackknife basically yep so then that's like well you know if i did that same head within the body and then just spun deer hair or soft or any type of uh synthetic and use that little bulb as a dam mm -hmm. one i'm diverting water flow and two i'll be able to keep that support to make that hair stay Wait. high for gotcha. the, throughout its life yep. and never compress over time it's mm -hmm. just inherent i mean eventually materials lose their elasticity and then they just don't have it anymore. Right. Um, and so I started adding that into the body and then I was having these massive bodies and they, they just really had a huge body in the water and I was seeing more and more interest from the fish. And then, you know, then started playing with articulations and, you know, I had a wire bending tools and stuff and just, you know, from making spinner baits and whatever. And, you know, got into that realm for a little bit because we, you know, we we were musky fishing with conventional lures. And mm -hmm. so I just like, you know, what if I was just playing with a paperclip one day, just messing around and just kind of folded it over. It's like, you know, what 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 if I just made a cup, you know, and, and I knew we always had we are there was already shanks out there like for for uh, spay flies and whatnot, yeah. you know, had the upturned eyes. And I was like, well, what if I just start adding some more shanks and stuff maybe i'll get a little bit more movement out of it and so i i did like in the beginning you know right around that same time there was a lot of people starting to use like double deceivers and whatnot for trout mm -hmm. and you know i was seeing other things there was been a lot of other catherine wood had a couple different things that he was playing with and stuff and mm -hmm. so i just kind of took all that information and just kind of pieced it together and started saying well if i had this t-bone with the mass and then maybe added another shank another hook to it or whatever you know maybe i can get more of a jackknife to it and ended up you know that's kind of where the t-bone came from but i learned a lot from the t-bone because it showed me one that i could get more of a serpentine movement by adding i you know i would add a shank and then another hook so i'd have you know two articulations and then i was like again playing with that thing it's like what if i downsized these things and made a bunch of shanks um, and you know, there's all at the time, like there was all kinds of swim baits coming out on the market. 
mm. right that had that had that serpentine movement and right. and i was like well you know i could create a vertebrae this is getting into the game changer so i mean that's what i'm saying all all these flies that i've created over the years are stepping stones to where i am now and the jerk know? the jerk just to not the jerk but the t-bone was essentially one right and it would yep. stop and it would buckle yeah uh, yep. uh, you know correct me if i'm wrong but that was my uh, you know, in my reading, that's what I understood. And then you got yep. to the spine idea, which was to do this multiple times. Yes. I got yep. it. Yep. Yep. So well, it was, know, uh, it, it was an interesting learning curve, you know, um, you know, uh, trying to catch a fish that doesn't want to eat or doesn't have to eat. It teaches right. you a lot of ways how not to catch something. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so you, you know, the Thomas Edison quote, right? Yeah. Um, Okay, because he knows a hundred ways not to create electricity. He's really famous yeah. for this one, this one outcome. But in the end, and the other thing, when you're speaking a minute ago, I thought of this other quote. I don't know why this is the way my head is, but uh, there's a quote that says, "When the student is ready, the teacher will appear." And you've said a couple of times how fortunate you were to bump into this person, Rich or whoever, at this time. You know. Yeah. And it's I don't believe personally. I don't believe in coincidence. You know. I mean, I think it things yeah. happen. You know, yeah, I, I, I do too. I mean, I, I, I do too. I, I, so I've been very blessed. I mean, I put myself in the right situations at the right times too, but, um, well, I just, think you but pay I it do. back to my friend, you're generous. And, uh, you know, that's kind of how you were taught, I would submit. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And I, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, yeah, my, I mean, I, my grandparents, my parents, yeah, they, they're old school. They taught me, you know, you got to treat people how you want to be treated and there you go. respect everybody. Yeah. Right. So. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of creativity out there, but the thing I've heard also so consistently through this conversation and, and like we were talking about before we turn this thing on, I've probably done about 30 podcasts and there's really some traits, uh, that great anglers share. I mean, there's an article cooking in my head about what they are, but certainly one of them is that commitment to observation and, you know, you, you know, and, and, and solving a problem, not just, uh, and I've got this, I've probably told it a couple of times on a podcast, but we're offshore with this guy, a Rhode Island captain, Lou DeFusco and, and another one, uh, Jack Springle. And we're at a, a high flyer and he threw a, uh, lure in there to see if there were mahi. Right. And he took like two cranks, five of them rushed out. None of them ate. And he wasn't on his third crank. And he said, they don't want it. Pulled it out, made a switch and fired it back in there half a crank and he's tight. And this has made an incredible impression on me because he had the sense, the awareness, the experience, whatever it was to say they don't want it. I know so many anglers would have thought they didn't see it. I threw it on the wrong side. You know, they'd have stuck with that lure a couple of times and reading and observing and seeing, you know, the fact is if they wanted it, they'd have killed it. Yeah. Right? And they oh, yeah. didn't, so they didn't. And he made a change. To put on a lure that I've never seen anyone eat, and a crank later he was tight. So, uh, you know, it <laughs> yeah. really, uh, Luda, Captain Ludafusco made a real uh, uh, unforgettable kind of impression that, you know, that, 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 um, you know, they're there to, that's what they do. And if they, oh, yeah. they're going to finish the job. 100%. Yeah. They definitely, they're very aware of their surroundings, you know, right. um, especially if they, like you said, if they, they rushed out. They they were very aware of it being there, yeah. right? So, yeah. um, they had a chance to eat it. It's like same thing with muskies. Um, you know, uh, unless they're asleep and they don't notice it, uh, you're going to know pretty quickly if you're throwing the right thing or not. And mm -hmm. and that's been the progression in a lot of the flies too. It's like, you know, the traditional musky flies that are used on daily. That's you know, um, and the T bone. I mean, I've progressed from that to the game changer platform. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I've seen the difference in how they react, especially as fish get pressured, you know, sure. uh, our waters are not getting any, uh, they're not getting any more remote in these right. days, right? Yeah. So We've uh, never had more anglers. We've never had better tackle. We've never had better technology, be it imaging or social, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we've never had a more dynamic uh, environment, you know, in terms of temperature and all the other stuff, you know, what's going on. Yeah. Um, you know, let's talk through these um, last three, finesse, hybrid, and jerk. Start mm -hmm. with, the, with the finesse. Um, yeah. And because uh, I, I, I know they there are fundamental differences between them. And I know I should also, uh, you know, um, let people know um, 
about the chocolate factory and the, the flies uh, and uh, the whole series. There's there's a whole series coming, but so far these are a couple of them. And, I, and, and they are sort of the culmination of this progression, right? We've been talking yep. about the gummy, we talked about the T-bone. I think there's the finesse, the hybrid and the jerk to look at. And then of course, if you, um, that one right there is Jason Taylor, right? Uh, no, that's that's one I did. Oh, you uh, did. But, there was yeah. one of his in your on the Game yeah. Changer platform that blew my mind. He's a yeah. tremendous, uh, tremendous. Oh, Jason, he's he's one of my favorite tires. I love yeah. I love Jason. Yeah. And the other thing, not not for nothing, but uh, also innovative is your packaging. You know, yeah. paper comes in a in a cardboard box. It's got a little <laughs> window window so you can see the fly in there. And there's the work. I mean, it's it's really beautiful. Um, and so let's talk about those three. Can you sort of take the wheel and talk about the finesse, the hybrid, and the jerk? Yep, sure. So the finesse is the general name for what I what I what I consider finesse fishing. And finesse fishing to me is is technical fishing. It's like when fish are very spooky, when fish can see your offering very well, mm -hmm. very, very aware of your surroundings, crystal clear kind of water, pressured fish kind of scenario. That's what I considered the finesse. So the finesse are, in my mind, the most realistic versions of the Game Changer platform because mm -hmm. of the synthetic, the translucency of the materials. We can trim the fly and we can color it with markers or, or, or airbrush or whatever to match the bait exactly to whatever you want it to look like, like whether it be a shad and um, or whatnot. So... That fly to me is what I'm going to have with me no matter where I go in the world because, yeah. you know, that we tie them from two inches up to six inches. Two, three. This two. Is, yeah, yeah, they have we have a two inch, three and a half, four and a half inch out right now. Yeah. And we're going to eventually have like a five and a half. I think we're going to stop there. Yeah. Um, because what ends up happening when you have that kind of well, that's. I'll, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I've got some cool stuff coming with Larry. I don't doubt it for a minute. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the, but, uh, when I took that class with you down, we were on the road in Georgia. I joined you in the class. This is what we did. And yes. it, it, it has, you, you said it has all the aspects of the bigger stuff. It's just something you can finish and teach reasonably easily. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that fly, I mean, the, that, that, the great attributes about that is it, it, it has, it has the triggering and attracting qualities. It has the movement that the fish want to see. You can have, you can, it's going to swim like a real fish. So it's got that three dimensional swimming action. Yeah. Right. It's got a profile um, on it. it. It's got profile silhouette. And again, yeah. like I said, you can trim it, you could color it to match any type yeah, of bait. I, th I think I'm gonna, you know what I mean? I think yeah. weight is, and then I'll go to town. Um, yeah. And can I just ask a, a question that, I, uh, just so listeners and me are not confused. How do you make the distinction between profile and silhouette? I hear all, a lot of tires use both. Sometimes they sound interchangeable. But they are, yeah, I mean, they, they kind of, they are interchangeable. So to me, profile is like when they're looking at it from the side and if you have a taller like or narrower. Yeah. yeah. Um, the silhouette, could be what they see from underneath. It could be what they see from from behind. I mean, that's kind of what I think. Like silhouettes, like even even if it's like a shadow of the it. The profile is you know? maybe one direction. Silhouette is the three D of it. Whether yeah, okay, yes, that, that that's how I. They, I mean, they are kind of interchangeable in a way, but that's how oh, I kind of look at it. Okay. Like like the profile is what the fly the the shape of the fly. The silhouette is like. I always looked at it the silhouette it's like like a trout looking at a dry fly from yep. underneath like right. with the silhouette of the fly on the surface right but for us streamer fishing and whatever that's not necessarily it could be how it's looking at it directly or up underneath or yep. even under under or if they're tailing on it too right so yep. but they are kind of they're kind of mingled in you know i would say that's kind of a somebody might have a better scientific explanation of that yeah. but that's kind of how i look at it but it has all the performance and action attributes of the big brothers, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. So in the big brother moving into the hybrids. Um, so what happens with the hybrids? And I got one here for you that I was yeah. going to send you um, specifically for you. This is a six and a half. And this is in that packaging yep. that we're talking about. 
So I got some white ones in because they haven't had time to really do the marking on these hybrids. But this has got the best of all worlds with the hybrids because what, what you run into when you get some of that tighter material, the tighter material you, you, you tie that fly, if you look at the one that you have, yep. as you tie them bigger, uh, the, going back to the finesse fly, yep. if you tie them super tight like that, what happens is it's, it takes longer for the water to get out between out from between the fibers. Okay. It may not absorb water. The fibers may be hydrophobic, but the tighter, the denser you make it, the, the longer it takes the water to get out from in between, right? right. So the finesse flies are super dense and tight. Got but it. the hybrids, you'll notice that, that are a little more separated. Yeah, I, I see have that. A, I, I have a stiffer fiber that's supporting a softer fiber. So, you know, the whole Game Changer platform is based on the vertebrae and the way water reacts around, reacts to the fibers that you put on the material. This is that so, laminar flow stuff, right? That, yeah, we're, yeah, the, the, again, you've heard me talk about laminar flow. Can you keep flow. it simple? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, not being an engineer, but here, I know you're going to like well, that that's one. That's a beauty, yeah. <laughs> yeah so. I'll get you. I'll get you this one here to you here soon. But um, that's one of the first samples of the the hybrid uh, shad. So nice. um, yeah, this is a six and a half inch version. So yeah, it's got all the all all the the great triggering qualities and tracking qualities that we're looking for. Looks like the real thing. Acts like the real thing. So it's got to be the real thing. But um, <laughs> the difference between the hybrids and and the the finesse is the problem that you run into, much like you know, again, problem solving and, and, and Popovic's being a mentor and teaching. Um, the great thing about the hollows, and, you know, and is that you have the illusion of size and mass without without having the problem of castability. Yeah. Right. So that's where you, that's where you kind of run into the problem when you come go into super realistic flies. And especially with the changer platform, you run into making it so realistic and so dense because that goes into the design of it so you have to the difference between so if somebody was to create like a beast fly on shanks yeah which is bob's favorite way to tie his beast flying that he does he doesn't like tying it on mono he mm -hmm. thinks it's too difficult for people to do so uh, he's he was very gracious to say i wanted to, i want to start promoting my fly to be tied on your shanks so the difference in in the beast and the reverse tie is he's doing as sparse of it's sparse sparsely tied as possible yeah so he so um even though he may have seven or eight shanks on there you're not going to quite get that swim like this out of his because he's relying on the bucktail tips that's that's kind of going through the water and the, the, yeah. the water going around the bucktail is making it kind of swim like that at the back end so mm -hmm. you're, you're still getting a swimming action but you're not getting that three-dimensional serpentine right. action Yep. And the only way you can do that is you have to divert water away from the center. So if water can penetrate through the fly, which it can do on a beast fly, um, it will not get that, that's that action there because mm -hmm. you basically have to create a ramp. So water is going to find the least the path of least resistance, yep. right? So if you have something that blockades that water, it's going to go around it. And what happens when it goes around it, it's going to come, it's going to try to come back. Yeah. But before it does that, I have another blockade and this is exactly how uh swim baits work. Okay. So it's the shape of the head. Yeah. So you create more like an arrowhead shape. Water is going to ramp around that arrowhead shape. So it's going away, but it's, then it's going to rush back to the body. Mm -hmm. But before it does that, you've created a, 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 a void basically. Yep. yep. So that's allowed the first shank behind the hook to move left or right. And it may, you don't know which direction it's going to start, mm -hmm. but by doing that, it might slide, slide slightly to the left. Water's going to hit it because it's not in line anymore. Right. So you create that chain reaction. If it started to the left, it's going to hit it and it's going to make it go right. So the, everything behind it follows follow. that. So yeah. left, right, right, left, right. So that's how you create that, that swimming action. But if it, if water can go through the fibers uninterrupted, yeah. you're not, it's just, it, you could have a hundred vertebrae or hundred shanks. Right, but they're you're not going to get that. You're not going to get that swim. Yeah. You might get a little tickle, but you're relying on the fibers at that point swimming for you. 
but you're not going to get that three-dimensional serpentine action. Sure. And so just jumping back to the um, finesse, more translucent in the water, this material, because yeah. it's clearly a different material here. Yeah. That's, that's what's forcing that. Um, well, they both must force the water around to get the, yeah. the action. But uh, um, this one, the, the, they both take the, markers okay? They do take both take markers really well. Okay. Um, the big thing about the finesse, you, the finesse looks like one body. Like it look like if yeah. you get if you look at that smaller one, that's the big hybrid. But if you look oh, at the smaller right. one, it, it yeah. looks it looks like it's one, one piece. piece. Yeah. yeah. And so it, and you, you can, can see make the it gap look in this. Yeah. yeah. You see, yeah. So you're seeing the kind of the sections, but you kind of have to do that because of the inheritance of creating a a stiffer material. So the way the hybrids work because you can yep. tie them up to 14, 16 inches long. Yeah. The reason they this work is, 11, is I think. right. Yeah. The reason those work and you're able to cast them reasonably well with the right fly lines um, is be, if, if you think about it, if you're doing yard work in the fall yep. and you need to trim some branches and then you get a big pile of branches, you like a huge pile of branches mm -hmm. that could be 10 feet high, just yep. a big pile of branches. It's still 75% air yeah, in right. there. You know, yeah. you have all these intertwining branches that are kind of, creating this pile. But if you had threw a tarp over that, over those branches, it's, you would think it's a solid, uh, sure. like a, like a house. Pile right? of dirt or something. Yeah. Right. So that's basically what we're doing with, with the hybrids is you're it's, creating a very stiff material that supports an outer layer, which would be your, um, your tarp. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you're, you're, you have 90 for 75% of it. It's a stiff fiber that's intertwined mm -hmm. that that's, a lot of air pockets and whatnot. It's not, it's not like super, uh, not, it is stiff, but it's not super, uh, dense. Yeah. Okay. So it's, so it's kind of like, it's like they say in golf, like you can hit it through a tree because it's 90% air, right? right. <laughs> that right. didn't right. work out for me most of my career in golf, but, <laughs> but, but, but they say that. So, yeah. um, but you know, it's just like you have all these intertwining branches, but it's like looking at a tree in the winter versus looking at a tree in the summer. Right. I mean, if you look at a tree that's full of leaves and everything, it's just, you know, if you've never seen one before, you would think it's a solid object, but you see right. it in the winter, it's just very sparse. And, right. and that's, you know, it's, it's, you've just seen these branches. So that's how, that's what, that's the, basically the, the, the essence of a, um, of a hybrid is um, it's 75% stiffer branches holding up the outer yeah, leaves. Good. I think it's hard for people to see. I've been playing with it. You can really see there's a whole bunch of space in here as well yeah. and but also the material itself feels uh maybe it's just because the other one's so short but it's stiffer or something yes. right yeah it is so the base is stiffer and then the outer outer fibers where the water hits yeah are flatter and straighter so it creates more laminar flow which it slides over that fiber much easier so so you have the stiff fibers that support the uh the Gee. straight line fibers so uh, so what it creates is it sheds water super fast yeah, like you can pull it out of the water and shake it one time really hard, and it's seventy five percent dry. Yeah, you make one back cast, and it's a hundred percent dry. Got it, got it. It so it's designed to shed water like like that. Excellent. So, so you literally pull a fly out of the water, and it looks like it's peeing. I mean, it yeah. just pours out of it. Right, right. So, so um, moving on to the jerk, I don't have any because there's none left. So uh, <laughs> you make more, it's like Doritos, yeah. man, make more. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, you have one handy on your desk? Uh, maybe? Yeah, I do. Yeah, Thanks. Um, I do. Hold on a second. All right, here, here's, uh, here's a, I think the eight inch right here. Yeah. So the eight inch, the jerk changer is my answer to like a fluke. Uh, that non-mechanical, that non-mechanical crazy left, right, up, down, not really knowing where it's going to go. It's, it's kind of my answer to the dot. Yep. Um, yep. And, and I've tested it in a lot of places. Um, I, I tested it up at Cape Cod last year. Yeah. And had some really good success with it. Um, caused some really big reds and um, tarpon in different places and whatnot. It, it, it's just, it's like talking about that non-mechanical action, that, that just that fleeing, crazy, wounded, just, yeah. it just makes... Lefty, I mean, uh, Dahlberg's got this um, thing that he likes to say, B 
big predatory fish are designed, they're kind of kings of their world, right? And, and they're designed to get rid of things that don't belong. Hmm. Um, and I think that's that's the case. I mean, why else would they hit some things that are just outrageously ridiculous? Yeah, it doesn't belong. So that's a that's another trigger built in trigger to big predatory fish is like that they, they kind of they're kind of nature's way of making things right in the world in sure. their environment. They're sorting so things out. They're they are sort they're the ones that sort things out. Yeah. And um, th that's one way to look at certain things. Why fish will eat stuff that they shouldn't eat, and and then but. That's not all. That's to me, I'd much rather have something look like the real food and then act like it's super hurt. Right. That to me is like the best of all worlds. Um, mm -hmm. I very rarely throw crazy colors anymore, like clown colors or whatever. And I know there's days where they just work. There's certain some days, like for whatever reason, certain things work. And why that's the case, who knows? Um, once I figure that out, I guess I'll, you know, <laughs> I'll quit. But I mean, that's well, the kind of the, the. It does seem to me that, you know, the. The, uh, you know, combination of profile action and silhouette, that non-mechanical movement, um, you're setting up a scenario for an opportunistic feeder, right? Um, so yep. that when they see the chance, it, it, it checks the boxes and they, they hit it versus follow yep. it, right? Um, yes. And um, there are other occasions where they're so dialed in on something, they can see it, they get a good long look at it, like on a flat. Or something yep. like that, you know, and that's just a different, you know, kind of uh, uh, situation. I think you said in the beginning, uh, triggering versus attracting, um, and you know, opportunity is a trigger if it if it if it there isn't a reason to follow it. You know what I mean? In other words, oh, yeah. you're more confident. Is that am I? hundred uh, percent. And right. that goes back to what I was kind of kind of briefly went into with uh, the progression of the flies. Yeah, and going from the T bones to the the game changers mm -hmm. and 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 very rarely do i use any of the traditional musky stuff that i used to use i mean i yeah i don't i can't tell you the last time i used a t-bone on on a musky because yeah. of the because i feel like i've designed the flies where the true the the, the the all everything is built into the fly to make that fish eat farther out from the boat yeah. so i don't have that many follows to the boat anymore where we're figure eighting. Oh, wow. nice back in the day I would say 60 to 70% of our eats were at the boat on figure eights. It's because yeah. the fly didn't quite have the, uh, tr the, the final trigger that made them want to eat. So you would have the fish come to the boat and then you'd have to do these figure eight maneuvers, which was constantly showing profile and speeding up and taking it away. Yeah. Right. So to me, that, it looks that ridiculous. My... It looks ridiculous. Yet they'll still <laughs> come in there and smash it. Yeah. But you know, I, but I've caught, I've caught bat, bass doing that. I've caught trout doing that. I've caught stripers doing that. Yeah, cobia. I've caught a, a lot of a, a redfish. I've caught figure eighty. Oh, yeah. I got. I got to do that. I thought it was a musky thing. But, no, uh, I mean it, it. No, don't. I mean, don't give up on a fish at the boat. Sometimes, yeah. man. So, right. yep. So, but I bet you're right. I mean, all of that has kind of taught me about you know how these fish are are built too. Like, um, you know that progression of going from different fibers and the progression of the game changer platform in itself. I mean, I've used everything from water absorbing materials to non water absorbing materials. Like there's a whole thing. Like when you go smaller with a, with a game changer style fly, a swim, mm -hmm. what we'll call as a swim bait fly, you need to have more water absorbing fibers in your design because as the fly gets smaller, it's obviously lighter in the water in the way that it reacts yeah, in the water. Just, yeah. I, I want it to get kind of in a black of a better word. I want the, I want it to get heavier so it will have more movement, sure. but you don't quite need that as you get bigger Yeah, because of the mass and the bulk and all that stuff built in. So, um, that are, those are things I had to learn. And so, you know, as I got super small with stuff and, and going into the, like the super tiny nymph world and, yeah, like micro crustaceans and shrimps and stuff where you where you got super and this is where I've kind of got super geeked out here lately with permit and whatnot and trying to create to me. I mean, that's kind of my my next my next thing and whether I get it or not. I mean, permit, you know, I've been told many times that a permit or not. They're, they're not honest fish, right. you know, neither are muskies, but yeah. I, <laughs> it's like. 
Seems, for, to, be your, seems to be your specialty. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just say I'm not afraid of failure. You know, yeah, I failed yeah. a lot. I mean, like I said, most of the flies I've created is by failing and get my ass kicked a lot. So that's, I'm not afraid. Maybe I'm, my dad said, if you're going to be stupid, you better be tough. So there it is. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so. um, I don't, I, I want to make sure I, I don't remember you speaking about the, uh, the jerk changer and the, and the, 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 what you get by that longer front segment, it's different than the other flies. I, I didn't hear you yeah. say it. I, I think the folks yeah. would, would want to understand that. Yep. So there's a couple things with the jerk. So um, to create a glide bait or a, a fluke style fly, you um, the biggest problem there is is drag. Mm -hmm. And most of the reason flies don't do that crazy action unless you put something on it, whether it be a lip or 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 barbell collar or yeah. or whatever. Um, the the only way you can achieve that so. Like if you look at some of the baits, they're 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 dense and they're solid, right? Yeah. So flies pulse. So fibers, yeah. whether no matter what it is, like marabou or anything like bucktail, yeah, they're not hard plastic. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the jerk, this thing looks like the finesse. It's Correct. super dense. Yeah. So we got the best of both worlds here. So we created a, a material in the brush that that sheds water really quick. Yeah. but it doesn't pulse or doesn't compress in the water. Okay. So it stays rigid. So as water flows over it, it doesn't change as much. I see. So, but the other thing is, is I have a static front end that is at least equal to the back end. So if I have a 10 inch fly, the front end's at least five inches equal to the back, which is five inches. Yeah. Um, and by doing that, I'm also hiding the hook within the fly itself because having a hook hanging underneath and you'll know this by rigging soft plastics properly. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if you would rig a fluke with that, you know, a Texas style or, you know, where you run it through and the hook goes back in the body. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's all within the bait. And if you rig a fluke properly or any soft plastic, it swims all over the place crazy. Mm -hmm. But if you just take a J hook and hook it through like a jig, it doesn't have the same action. It'll, you it'll know? heal it a little. Yeah. Yeah. It just yeah. doesn't have that same crazy action that it does that way. Gotcha. So I figured out if I could create less drag in the water and not, not have the compression and have the right shape that the fly will be able to slide and glide in the water. And it, um, with, with the right amount of leader and whatnot, this fly will, you can get it to move almost as much as two feet in the water hmm. that slide one way. So the key is, is get it to slide back that way. Sometimes it doesn't want to do that. It might want to go down or might go want to pop up out of the water, but, to me, I don't think that's not, I don't look that as a negative. Yeah. Because I want it to be in balance and I want it to act super erratic and, and wounded because that to me is what a jerk bait slash fluke style bait should act. Right. That non mechanical. That non mechanical. You know, so uh, we, we had the with, jerk changes when they arrived on a display right up front. And, uh, you know, Folks would, would admire the hell out of them, and we'd explain a little bit about the hook being further back and the more than half the length versus some of the other patterns, you know? And they would just go, they'd look at it and they go, June. You know, <laughs> so they, they need, they can't wait for June, you know? And it's, yeah. uh, so uh, that's our, that's our prime striper time, you know? And uh, uh, really. Um, well, I'm going to have to come up and see you in June. <laughs> I, I'd love it. That'd be great. That'd be great. Well, let's change gears here. And, and uh, before I do that, I'd remind people that this podcast is brought to you by the Saltwater Edge. And would you please think of us? You have any needs in surf, fly, or inch light tackle? Uh, we're here to help you make the most of your time on the water. So um, it'd be helpful if you, if you have an occasion or give us a try. Uh, either come by the store in Middletown, Rhode Island, or uh, jump on the website. Um, so let's wrap it up with a couple of questions. Okay. Um, you've got a a, a, a catalog of flies, but uh, what would be the two? Um, and since you produce them yourself, that's what I'm going to ask you about yours. I you, ask other people, what are your two uh, go, you know, preferred lures or flies, depending what their specialty is. So in your case, in with your catalog, would you pick out of your lineup? What are the two flies you find you reach for most often? Um, I would say in salt water, go ahead and give you some boundaries, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I would. All right. So if, if, if it's specific to bait fish sure. um, and not crustaceans, uh, yeah. because I would say the changer crawl is a very important crustacean style fly that I love. 
Yeah. But um, I would like to have three per four actually. But oh, you um, may go ahead. Yeah. So the <laughs> finesse, the, I'm gonna always have the finesse because I can match about any bait fish from six inches and down with that. Yep. And um, and and that that's like like I said, a go to and anywhere I go because I know I can I can make fish eat with that fly. I know. Yeah. I mean, they're they're just gonna eat it. And they can get a long look at it, and 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 it, that's the one you have yep. that kind of confidence in. Got it. Yep, yep. And um, you know, if I could only choose two, I would probably take the jerk, just because then I can create that crazy action right. um, that I like. Uh, but the, you know, like I said, the hybrids, like the ones we talked about, the hybrids are. If we're fishing bigger baits, I mean, that's going to be, I got to have that. You know, as a fly, it, there's not many, I mean, I, I, I needed the opportunity to do it myself, but you just look at it and you go, this has got so many of the, the built in triggers that other flies, um, you know, sometimes maybe they present the profile or they have a nice swim, but this seems to have the, all of those components, you know, to, yeah. um, and, and, um, you know, I'm thinking less about the more recent fly designs, but the older big bunker patterns were just like throwing wet socks. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, oh and, yeah. And the and fact I, that this I, is made no, out of I'm, something that'll dry out on a back cast. Yep. But I mean, it's, I mean, but anytime you get something with a lot of bulk, um, it's going to be a little bit harder, but there, you know, there's fly lines out there that makes the job easier. And yep. you yep. as a shop owner and your employees know that and understand the lines that need to be used yep. for that application. Um, yeah, I mean, once you start getting into flies that eight, eight, eight inches or bigger, I mean, they become not super great fun to cast, but, uh, I think it's the, uh, I think it's a hundred percent worth the effort because right. I've seen the results. Right. Um, and, and it makes you a better caster. Once you learn how to cast these big flies, it's, yeah. there's just nothing you can't do in fly right. fish. Right. Right. Um, the, uh, so what are two resources, uh, you found helpful you know we, we grew up uh, i'm older than you but uh we talked about books we talked about magazines how great and how many there used to be i mean i got a, i i'm always going into my library that some of these books are 20 30 years old but they're still well worth it but um are there any tools or resources and again think it's salty uh that you make regular use of uh other than books and magazines, I mean, uh, the internet, I mean, yeah. and podcasts, I mean, those yeah. that, like stuff like what you're doing with saltwater. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I mean, to me, there's just so much great information out there now. I mean, the yeah. internet's just a click away from, I mean, you, if you could think of it, it's going to be out there, right? Yeah. It's like, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 Be curious. That, that, and I, I mean, I've really gotten, I've not been much into the podcasting until this past year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, more I'm doing them myself, the more I like kind of listening to them. And like I said, I mean, just I'm I really I've always been into the history. And like we said, I mean, the touching moment with me and, and Larry was just we were on a trip together and just, you know, just really appreciating him spending time with me and taking me on this trip and whatever. And I just said something. It's like I really appreciate it. Like, let me ride on your coattails and yeah. that's where I, that's where he said that whole thing about that's not what it's going on if you're standing on the shoulders that came before you right yeah. so yeah uh i mean to me and like that and now as i get older just listening to all these people that come before me and everybody else it's kind of just kind of made the path better like lefty and mm -hmm. and and um listening to what millhouse is doing I mean, and and what you got, you're doing, like that that whole thing, that podcast you did with Popovics, and just yeah, you know, just listening to the stories and 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 seeing where yeah, things came from. Yeah, no, yeah, that's the history, you know, and it goes, uh, um, you know, I think that's one of the great things about a podcast is you can you, you hear their inflection, you hear their humor, you you see their smile. It's it's great. It's great. Hey, uh, I wanted to recommend a podcast to people. You did. Uh, you've been doing a series for the Guide Association called Game Changer. Yeah. And one of the ones you went full geek with that uh, with that fish vision guy. Yeah. Yeah. What's his name? Andre Hordisky. And it was one of the early ones, right? Yeah. 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 So he he's a fisheries biologist, um, was and a professor at Hampton University. But I think he I think he. He switched careers and he's still a fisheries guy. And his main study was in fish vision. Fish vision. So I, I would always call him and 
I mean, he, he, he was a, he's a fly tire and loves fishing and whatnot. So he was always a sounding board for me to kind of bounce ideas off of back sure. 20 up to 20 years ago now. And, yeah. um, but his, his knowledge of, of fish and, and especially the cones in their eyes and, and knowing what colors they see and how they see things right. is, it's pretty cool. And yeah, so I did, a, I did with him with, um, with the ASGA, uh, that was a really good one about a year ago, I think maybe yeah. something yeah. like that, yeah. but yeah, I'd recommend that to folks. If you're looking for a great podcast, that game changer series that, that's on ASGA's website. Um, so, uh, I guess uh, I just asked you, where can audience find out more about you, Blaine? I mean, you're 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 out there a lot, uh, doing a lot of things. You got a great social presence. Uh, the chocolate factory is just uh, starting to, to fire. I know uh, the product's available in a handful of shops, but it, that's intentions to uh, expand. Um, yeah. You got your book. Um, you got the Game Changer uh, um, podcast at the at the Guide Association. And you're doing some uh, clinics as well, right? Is there some of that? Yeah. Like you did something yeah. recently. Can people yeah. Do, yeah. look out for more of that? Yes. Yeah. That's as I'm getting older, I, you know, um, my main focus is like the, doing more design stuff, doing more travel, promoting yeah. the flies that I've created over the years and getting to see some of these places I wanted to go to over the years and, and getting off the water out of the middle of the boat and getting in the front of the boat <laughs> for change or the, but you know, instead That's of the, the middle or the back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. I mean, a big part of what I'm doing is um, just designing and testing and and whatnot, and and other things is going and visiting shops. You know, I did the show circuit for many years, but I, I feel like I feel like there, I get more out of visiting a shop, like visiting you and doing the, doing that show that you did, than going to these bigger shows these days. Because I feel like. You know, you get more one on one with yep. with not only the shop owners and the employees there, but the people that come and see you um, yep. and you get a chance to really kind of talk to them. And, you know, um, they get a chance to ask you more questions where you don't feel like you're, you know, um, being on the go constantly. You know right. what I mean? Sure. So I've really enjoyed those. And, and that way a shop can have you there and you can you can maybe do a talk the night before and then do a whole day of doing different things and then finishing up the day doing a private tying class. And I've really enjoyed that concept. And I, and I feel like the people that have come out in the shops I've got, done it with, have, uh, felt like it's, it's been really worth it. And, yeah. and, and I just feel like it's a better way of giving back and, and, um, kind of teaching my philosophy. Connect, and connecting with people. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a better format. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you mentioned it, and I'll, I'll ask it, and then I have one more question. But what are a couple uh, um, spots left in your bucket list? What what gets Blaine excited? I, I, like I said, man, I, I'm going to get more into permit um, yeah. here in the next couple years. Uh, I still I still love everything I do. Um, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I've got I've got you know a tarpon. I can't get enough of that. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't ever I don't get enough t time to fish for tarpon. But you know, there's there's you know, permits kind of, that's definitely on my radar. I, right. I would love more than anything. I mean, like I said, I, I'm used to not catching fish, you know, um, and I'm used to, you know, spending the days and hours not catch them, but getting that moment where you see something where yeah. that they like, and then you kind of follow it away. And, and, you know, like I said, I mean, my, my next thing is I'm really trying to, to design a permit fly. Hopefully that's, that really kind of makes a difference in targeting sure. them. Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, one last question that I ask, uh, everybody, um, you've got one day, uh, left one place, one place left to fish, uh, you know, generally not spots, <laughs> but where are you going and what are you fishing for? How, how would you, what would your walk off be, um, on your last day? Uh, uh you know what? Yeah, I don't know, man. That's a tough one. I would Post right me. now just because <laughs> I haven't done it enough, probably tarping somewhere. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Um, you know, I think as I get older, it might just come back home and smallmouth fish. Sure. You know, take Tyler with you. Yeah. Take my, yeah. Fishing with my son, my dad. Yeah. 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 Well, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Sounds, per sounds like perfect. And a great, a great place to end the podcast too, man. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Get my daughter and my son and, you know, family, everybody out there probably, I mean, family, that's everything. Yeah. So. Family first. That's right. Well, good stuff, buddy. Uh, thanks so much for uh, 
your patience, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, uh, we, we, we had this, we had to scrap to make this happen and we have, so yep. I do appreciate it. And, uh, like I said, excited to see, uh, chocolate factory boxes, uh, arriving and, uh, some super cool, uh, products coming out and, uh, excite, uh, you know, uh, all the best to you, your family and, uh, the chocolate factory. All right. You too, man. Thanks for all the support. I really love having you as a dealer. So you betcha. We'all see you along the right. way. Take care, man. Thanks, man. All right. Bye-bye.